Okay, welcome to the last session for today. It's uh, been a long day, but I hope an exhilarating day. Uh, tonight we welcome uh, Roya Hakakian. Um, as it turns out, uh, we were talking earlier today about the 1953 coup and the uh, and the way that coup was treated in the introduction to the new Ben Affleck uh, movie, Argo. And by coincidence, our speaker wrote about that issue today <laughs> in the Daily Beast, which is the online partner uh, publication to Newsweek magazine. Uh, and her connection to uh, the hostage crisis uh, is that uh, she was a, as you'll find out when you read this Daily Beast piece, she was a 12-year-old girl protesting outside the American embassy in Tehran at the time of that uh, crisis. And she wrote a book uh, based upon her experiences growing up in Iran. She, her family left in the middle of uh, the 1980s uh, in a book called Journey from the Land of No. And being a personal reflection of what those events were like and what the country was like as she was growing up, it may be of particular use in your classrooms because she's writing about somebody who was young in basically the same age bracket as some of your students. So you might uh, find that of particular use. That, however, is not the book she'll be discussing tonight. You, you have already received a copy of her uh, more recent book, uh, Assassins of the Turquoise Palace, which has been named a notable book of the year for 2011 by the New York Times and among Newsweek's top 10 not to be missed books of 2011. She has been a founding member of the Iran Human Rights Documentation Center. Her writings appear in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times. She's helped produce uh, programming for CBS 60 Minutes and for other journalistic collections on uh, network news. So. Uh, Without further ado, let me ask you to welcome Roya Hakakian. Thank you. Good evening. Um, just so um, I, I can clarify further what a great, um, important job you as history uh, teachers, professors are doing around the country, I must give you an anecdote about how the cover of that book came about. And then you realize what a, uh, what an important job you are doing. Um, so I had submitted my manuscript and my publisher contacted me and said, um, this is the last stage, we, uh, we just need a cover and do you have any ideas? And I said, well, you know, I wrote it. It took a long time. Um, you throw some ideas at me and I'll tell you if I like it or not. Um, and so how many people can guess uh, what, what the book uh, cover that they proposed uh, was? So they, they look at it, they see it's about Iran, post-revolutionary Iran, and the cover was uh, a mosque with the image of Ayatollah Khomeini mixed together. And, uh, um, and, I, and this is uh, from perhaps the little uh, bio or whatever it is that on the back of the book you have read, you already know that this is an anti-Ayatollah Khomeini book. This is a book about um, how all of that uh, has come at a great expense to uh, the Iranian diaspora, uh, among others. And so I had to politely decline and say that this was not a good cover, but of course I wanted them not to be disappointed and keep trying. So when I said, um, no, this is not exactly correct, could you try something else? Uh, the next cover that came back was The Ruins of Persepolis. <laughs> you know. <laughs> And, and I realize that um, there are two extremes um, within the forefront of what an average person, even a very educated person uh, who's working at, at a book publishing company uh, thinks about when they think about Iran. It's either um, the, the clerics, the mullahs, so to speak, or the ruins of Persepolis, and there is hardly anything else in between. So this was my roundabout way of saying, you have a lot of work, uh, and a lot of really important work um, that you have to carry out. And um, um, now, um, uh, you're all history teachers, professors, and historians, uh, uh, to one degree or another, and I'm not one. 
Uh, what I really am, having written two books of nonfiction in English, is uh, in a way a historian's ombudsman. Uh, I, the stories that interest me, the stories that I have adopted and uh, taken on to write about are the stories that I, as an Iranian, um, having lived through the Iranian Revolution, uh, I left Iran in, in August of 1984 with my mother, and uh, having arrived in America and being a proud US citizen now, um, um, but having really um, great attachments to the two cultures and the two people, um, I look for stories that I uh, don't find within uh, a media that is constantly covering Iran. I, and in that way, I consider myself an ombudsman. I, I look at things, uh, or I should say a self-appointed ombudsman. I look at the things that um, I consider, um, in my own uh, terminology, fundamental narratives about Iran. Um, and I look to see whether those fundamental narratives exist um, not because I have personal sentimental attachments to them, um, and God knows I do, uh, but also because I think those fundamental narratives are essential in, in the way um, policymakers think about Iran, in the way um, teachers think about Iran, in the way ordinary Americans think about Iran. I think uh, of those fundamental narratives of which uh, this book and this narrative that I'll get into today uh, is one as being the tools with which, or I should say, the window through which I think um, we ought to look at Iran in order to have the proper perspective. Now, um, the speakers that I've, the brilliant, uh, some of the brilliant speakers that I've uh, had the good fortune of listening to today uh, pointed out some of the narratives, some of the aspects of what's missing in these conversations. I have my own views of, of what's missing. Um, for instance, the memoir that I wrote came as a result of having worked in television news, both at ABC uh, with the Peter Jennings document, with the late Peter Jennings documentary unit, and at uh, CBS's 60 Minutes. And um, in, in both networks, I would often be assigned to look at the uh, archives of contemporary Iran. And oftentimes, I was uh, I had to go back and look at uh, what was available in those archives from the Iranian Revolution. And um, fast forwarding through dozens of hours of archival material, I oftentimes didn't find the revolution as I had witnessed it as a fledgling teenager um, growing up under uh, that revolution. And I would see a huge discrepancy between what the cameramen and the photographers and the reporters had brought back and what I remembered uh, or what I knew to be true. And so the first time that I decided to write uh, for the first time in English, um, which was about 14 years ago, uh, <clears throat> my memoir was really the result of seeing that the Iranian revolution was uh, not simply misunderstood, but um, understood in, in the fashion that the conquerors um, uh, had wished for that history to be recorded. In other words, uh, the Iranian revolution was um, identified here as an Islamic revolution, and that, that subject was not open to debate anymore. And the general understanding was that Iran had been uh, all along a Shiite nation with uh, Islamic dreams and uh, the wish of the millions of the people who showed up on the streets in Iran in 1978 and 1979 was to not to have a democracy uh, like the kind of democracy we have here, but, but to bring to power a theocracy. And, and that was one of the things that I saw, um, that, that was one of the discrepancies I found as having lived in Iran and having been part of or um, or at least a sympathizer to, to the generation, to the young generation that brought the revolution about uh, in urban centers, secular, educated, middle class Iranians, uh, that was one huge discrepancy. I, I remember that revolution, or I became interested in that revolution, rooted for that revolution, because um, 
I thought it was a revolution on behalf of freedom. It was, uh, it was the event that was going to give us free press and, and uh, freedom of speech and, uh, and the publications of so many uh, books and other works of literature that had uh, until then been banned because there was no, uh, because there was censorship. Um, um, another aspect that, that also drove me uh, to, to write that memoir, another major discrepancy, was that Iran had somehow uh, been registered uh, within the post-revolutionary records as being a purely um, uh, a Shiite nation um, with, uh, with, with uh, a desire for zealotry or religious extremism. And again, that was not, um, that, that was uh, not incongruent, not congruent according with, with the stuff that I remembered, with the experiences that I lived through. Um, um, I, I was born and raised in a Jewish family and the neighborhood in which I grew up was a very eclectic neighborhood. And it wasn't until after the revolution that uh, the notion of, um, uh, anti-Semitism or uh, religious tension even became an issue. And even then, um, there, I found that there was far more tolerance uh, within classrooms among classmates um, for the subject than there was among the administrators who were trying to um, overhaul a culture that, that uh, we all embraced as a people. Um, in, in this particular book that's before you, which wasn't actually what my publisher wanted me to write, um, because the memoir had been published, it had somewhat been um, successful um, for a first time uh, a writer who was writing in a second language. Um, and they wanted me to write more of the same book. They, they wanted me to do part two of book one. And, uh, and of course, being inherently stubborn, uh, I immediately realized that that's what people wanted me to do, and I decided that it wasn't obviously what I was going to do. Um, but of course, artistically, it, it, uh, it seemed like um, not something that would uh, foster thinking and creativity. And therefore, and, and God knows I was no longer interested in spending another second on my own history or, or background. Mm, and, and allow me to uh, inject the parenthetical here also and say that uh, even my memoir uh, is not about my entire life. I didn't have that much patience for myself. It's about 10 years of life uh, from 1974 to 1984. In other words, the transformation of Iran uh, from a monarchy to, to an Islamic republic. And that was as much time I could spend thinking about myself, my own family, and my life in Iran. Um, so the second book, I uh, tried to conceive in a way that uh, would somehow uh, be close to my heart, uh, uh, be a book that I still could uh, feel it within my own gut without um, really being immediately about myself. And, and in the process of that, I, I looked at one of the um, fundamental narratives, one of the major discrepancies that exists. Um, within the knowledge that uh, uh, even those who are interested in Iranian history lack about Iran. And then the question really arose, why? Why should a story of this importance have gone untold? Why do people who uh, deal with Iran, who think about Iran, whose job it is to pay attention to Iran, have not paid attention to this history? So perhaps by the end of this conversation, you and I will come up with an answer. I have a few hunches. Um, but so in, in that process, I, I thought um, that I wanted to write something that I uh, f had strong feelings for, but at the same time uh, was an important piece of information that was missing from this um, vast knowledge or vast coverage of Iran which is around the clock, but at the same time somehow limited um, uh, in, in, in scope. And in that process, I uh, met a man who 
uh, ended up being my house guest uh, about five years ago. And damn, he was a great storyteller. <laughs> and um, I didn't know him at all. He, he, um, he was at my house, a dinner guest, um, for about a few days. Uh, visiting my husband with whom he was friendly and uh, my husband is always late home from work and so he and I would hang out in the kitchen uh, at night and as I was chopping the onions and you know preparing dinner um, we had to make conversation and the thing that he uh, brought up was that uh, well tell me what have you you know what's what's been interesting about your history and of course he said, well, I was sitting in a restaurant once, and a man with a machine gun walked in and, and shot us uh, at our dinner table. And uh, you know, I ducked under the table behind me, and I survived. I said, you don't say. <laughs> you know? uh, so it was really uh, with complete uh, reluctance, uh, and perhaps I should admit uh, a great degree of ignorance that I ran into the story that became this book before you. Um, so I met, I met the survivor of this assassination that I recount in this book, and, and this is a very strange admission on my part because I'm a very squeamish person. I never uh, go to crime, I, I've never read crime novels. I, always reach for the remote control and change the station if somebody draws out a gun. So the idea that I wrote about an assassination is unbelievable to me. Um, however, uh, as he told the story to me, I uh, realized that the assassination itself, the, the actual killing, which was hugely intriguing to my publisher, by the way, as soon as I talked about it with my editor, um, he was he was really interested in the kinds of the guns and how many bullets and how many people dropped dead and how long did it take until uh, they were all definitively dead. Um, uh, all of these things didn't seem all that interesting uh, to me, actually. Uh, but what did seem incredibly intriguing was, was what happened um, after the assassination itself. In other words, um, between um, the time that the criminal investigation began um, and a trial about 13 months later started and a judgment that was issued nearly three and a half years later, meaning uh, within the complete arc of the timeline, about five years after the assassination had occurred, which, as you will see, uh, really shook Iran uh, and then its relations with Europe as a continent and then changed, in a way, um, the, the trajectory of Iran uh, in 1997 forward. And I hope to be able to get to all that uh, within the next 10 minutes or during the Q&As. Um, so I, I particularly wanted to talk about this because it's also very important to place Iran um, out within the Western context uh, and look at uh, the ways in which the international community has contributed um, to, mm, to the past 33 years, to what we have come to see as a regime that is unloved by its own people but continues to survive. Uh, so why? And I think um, one of the answers uh, here, uh, at least within the, this particular narrative, is that the international community, the European community in this particular example, um, uh, played a part in, in all this. Now, um, after I met with, uh, with the survivor and, and that dinner was over and several other dinners followed in which uh, he, with great detail, told me um, about everything uh, that had happened at the restaurant and, and you know, blow by blow events as they had unfolded, um, I had to decide whether I really wanted to do this. And so I um, traveled to Berlin I, because the assassination uh, took place at a restaurant in Berlin, Germany. Um, again, another parenthetical uh, and it was among the, uh, the stories that was mentioned earlier this morning. Um, the Saudi ambassador was uh, supposed to be alleged or was alleged to uh, 
be the target of an assassination by um, an Iranian agent uh, last year in Washington at a restaurant. And about a day and a half after that story broke, uh, Charlie Rose had me on and said, well, an assassination alleged by Iran in a restaurant, that sounds really outrageous. I said, well, I just spent four years producing a book about just that, um, and it wasn't outrageous. It, it simply seems outrageous when it fails. Uh, but in the case that, uh, that I've written about, when, when these assassinations succeed, when, when these um, cases of terrorism um, accomplish the mission that they set out to, then they don't seem outrageous and unbelievable. They, in fact, seem smart and well-planned. Um, well, um, to go back to where I was, uh, I, I went to Berlin to, to see whether there were other compelling characters that could draw me as much as the survivor had. And um, I went to the home of a, a widow whose husband had um, died uh, among the people who had died at that restaurant um, that night. And, um, when I got there, um, my, my modus operandi usually is that uh, even though I go there to interview people, I uh, leave a great deal of time in the beginning to allow the people who are meeting me to ask me questions. So I allow myself to be the subject of the interview. Um, and she talked to me, she asked me questions and told me the story according to the way that she wished to tell it to me. Uh, for the first, first couple of hours. And uh, the first question she asked me was, where do you come from? And um, at the time, I, I lived in New York. And I said, I come from New York. And, and then she said, her second question was, where were you on 9-11? And I told her that I was on a subway uh, heading to work in New York City. And I was stuck on the train, on a bridge, uh, where I could see um, this was um, a bridge connecting Queens, uh, the borough of Queens, to Manhattan. And I was looking um, at the World Trade Center smoking. So I said that to her. And she said, well, um, I'm really sorry um, that you had to see that. And I just want to tell you that when I saw the image of the towers fall um, here in Berlin on television, I didn't move from my television set for several days. That, and there was nothing else I could do, wanted to do, but fly to New York uh, and be with the widows of that incident of 9-11. Of and by the way, my husband was killed on 9-17. Um, I, I know this sounds very sentimental, uh, but, and, and of course we all know here in this room that Iran had nothing to do with 9-11. But I really liked the way she connected the two events together. I really liked the way she saw her own tragedy as the precursor to what happened on 9-11. I love the way that suddenly these two completely disparate incidents seem like the part of the same continuum. Um, and, and then I was convinced that I should do this book. That even though uh, the culprits were not the same, uh, the notion of th that connected these two incidents, the fact that here are two sets of widows uh, who have become victims of Islamic fundamentalism, uh, religious fundamentalism, and extremism. Um, one, you know, experienced it through uh, a machine gun operation, and the other was, you know, the falling of the two towers. Uh, but yet, they seem to be the same thing. And, and I found that um, this is really what, what I wanted, um, what I, continuously find myself doing, and that I, uh, it is profoundly part of what I believe is missing um, in the way that we look at Iran. Uh, we, uh, we fail to see 
how it is that rather than a nation against us, uh, there is a nation who is uh, in a way beside us, that some of the things that um, we have suffered from and we want to see uh, uprooted uh, or rooted out uh, are the very things that Iranians have been in the forefront of suffering from and becoming victims of. So uh, let me take you through some of the narrative and tell you, um, tell you about that night. So this is uh, from September 17, 1992, Berlin, Germany. And this is our scene. After nearly an hour prowling Prager Street, surveying the restaurant in its cul-de-sac, two hulking bearded figures rolled their collars up to their eyes and burst inside. A third man stood guard at the entrance. It was 1047. They darted through the main dining hall, past the lonely customer, nursing a last drink. Under the hall's archway, they entered the back room where a party of eight sat at a corner table. The taller of the two intruders stationed himself behind one of the diners, facing the eldest among them, a bald, bespectacled man in a gray suit who was addressing everyone. No one was yet aware of their arrival. The speaker, suddenly meeting the intruder's dark gaze upon himself, froze in mid-speech. Another guest asked what was wrong with him. The answer came from the intruder. You sons of whores. He thrust his gloved hand into the sports bag that hung on his shoulder. Then, a click. A shout came from the table. Friends, it's an assassin. The trail of his call faded in the roaring sound that followed. In the dimly lit air, sparks of fire flashed at the intruder's hip. Bullets, piercing the side of the bag, riddled the guests. After two rounds, 26 bullets, the barrage ceased. The elder guest was still in his chair, head slumped, blood tinting his white shirt, blending with the busy pattern of his tie. Another victim was doubled over, breathing noisily, gasping for air, his face smashed into a mug of beer. The golden liquid was slowly darkening. The second shooter walked up to the table, tucked his bare hand under his belt, and drew out a gun. He aimed at the elder man and fired three bullets into his head. Then he turned to, the one, to one of the bodies on the floor, a young, slender man dressed in white, what, until moments before, had been a crisp white shirt. Pointing his gun at the back of his, the man's head, he fired a single shot. Then he turned to the next body and aimed once more. But before he pulled the trigger, his accomplice motioned him to leave. They bolted out of the restaurant. The guard joined them at the door. They ran toward the sky blue BMW that was idling at the intersection across the cul-de-sac. The lead shooter reached it first. He grabbed the handles and swung both front and back passenger doors open. As he jammed himself beside the driver, he threw the bag behind him. The other two shoved themselves in the back seat. The driver stomped on the accelerator, nearly running over a pedestrian as he took off. Across the intersection, the engine of a black Mercedes roared, and it too took off and swerved onto a side street. In their wake, everything was once again as it had been on so many nights before. The breeze blew gently. A light drizzle fell softly. But lights had come on in the few windows overlooking the restaurant. A handful of neighbors had awakened on the fourth floor balcony of the building next to the restaurant, a young woman clutched the railing, leaning downward. Her auburn hair flowed over her white uniform, her skin still warm from the bike ride home. She peered intently at the sidewalk below, looking for the source of the blast that had shaken the floor of her living room. 
She was a curious bystander then, soon a witness to detail her account of the tremor beneath her feet, the tremor that would ripple through the continents, to, through the continent in the months to come. So this was the scene. And um, we have come um, to recognize um, the word fatwa in this country. And again, this was uh, among the topics that was discussed today with uh, Salman Rushdie, the, that in, after we heard about it for the first time in 1988, um, we assumed that Rushdie was uh, the origin of it all. Well, he wasn't. Um, and the, the four people who died in that restaurant that night were part of a large campaign that had already begun in 1979 with the rise of Ayatollah Khomeini to power. Um, and that campaign was successfully carried out in many, many countries um, from the United States to um, Sweden and Switzerland and Italy and, and uh, Germany and um, all sorts of places around the world. But, but we here in the West didn't hear uh, about all this. And we, the word fatwa only became important or known to us when it was issued um, for a British citizen. Um, and that's when we came to know it. So what's, what's the piece of information, uh, or what, what, what was very important to me as, as um, an Iranian American, as someone who looks for missing pieces of important history uh, that needs to be injected in this conversation is that, no, um, the first people who died um, as a result of these uh, decisions, these fatwas, were uh, Iranians themselves. Um, there was a list of 500 individuals um, who had left Iran and were being persecuted, um, looked at wherever they, they were from, um, you know, suburbs of Washington actually was one of the early, uh, earliest uh, assassinations that took place in the West, um, to all these other countries around Europe. And then Berlin uh, was one of the biggest cases because uh, four people died at the same time. And, and for the most part, uh, European governments turned a blind eye. Um, in, in two instances, um, the assassins were apprehended, but later um, uh, were returned to Iran um, as, as the officials in those countries cited national interest. So um, there was a way in which uh, Europe knew uh, that Iran was looking for trying to find uh, and assassinate, annihilate its own opposition around the world, but, but looked away uh, for you know, a variety of diplomatic, business, trade uh, reasons that, are, that hopefully you'll get into as, as you read the book. Um, now, so why choose this particular story as opposed to all these other ones, all the other 500? And by the way, the, the list of 500 wasn't uh, fully executed, and I, I would be blowing the ending of this book for you if I told you why. Uh, but why choose this one as opposed to any other, uh, as opposed to the other hundred some that were carried out successfully um, everywhere? Uh, well, because uh, it has a wonderful ending. And because um, it shows how it is that um, human beings, um, be it reporters, um, conscientious citizens, um, and <laughs> lawyers, uh, attorneys, judges who won't be pressured by corrupt politicians, uh, can make a tremendous difference. Um, and together, they can um, even uh, defeat terrorism as, as the list, as a result of this case, um, was never uh, completed. In other words, this is the case that put an ending to, that, to this particular um, round of assassinations by Iran around the world. And, and of course, um, I, I don't think I would be entirely ruining the ending of the book by saying that um, it, it happens to be 
uh, short of the recent round of sanctions by, Iran, by um, the, the Western world and led by the United States against Iran, the most important, the greatest blow that the international community in the most peaceful way has delivered to Iran um, and, and gotten results as a result of it. So here was this great judgment that was issued from this court, from this trial, uh, in April of 1997. And uh, <clears throat> as it was issued uh, and implicated the Iranian leadership in having ordered the assassinations five years earlier, every EU member nation withdrew its ambassador from Iran. And there was a period of complete diplomatic darkness between Iran and Europe for over five months. This is huge, because up until then, it was only the United States that Iran didn't have relations with. But it's very hard to justify um, for an entire nation why you also don't have relations with Finland and Switzerland and Sweden and France and Germany and Italy and all those other countries. And within those five months, uh, it, and again, I want to emphasize the notion of it having been perfectly peaceful um, not a bomb had been dropped, not a bullet had been shot. Um, but in, in the most civilized fashion possible, uh, Iran's campaign of assassination as a result of this uh, was successfully stopped um, or um, brought to a halt. And, um, and, and I also think that uh, this judgment had a major effect on the presidential elections that took place in Iran in June of 1997. The verdict was issued in April, and President Khatami, the, the man um, who we have come to know as the reform president of Iran, came to power in, in June. Uh, but in April, he was lagging way behind his rivals in the polls. Um, but as, the, as this, was, this judgment came forward, uh, he looked like the face that Iran needed to put to the international community. He, uh, appeared as the moderate, reasonable, uh, nonviolent human being or, or face of Iran that, that the international community was willing to make peace with. And, and I believe that even though the reform never really settled in Iran, um, but at least the wave of reform in Iran began. And um, I'll stop here and take your questions. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. That was uh, truly gripping. And uh, we'll open it up for questions. Again, just raise your 10 card vertically, and we'll go from there. Uh, about two weeks ago, there was the, uh, in Pakistan, there was the attempted assassination of Malala. And I know that was by an extremist, Talib. But given that, could you? give us an idea of your view of the unchanging and changing role of women in Iran. I really love it when a question um, makes it possible for me to plug one of my pieces. Uh, <laughs> so so I, I wrote uh, my reaction to, to the Malala situation uh, as a relatively extensive op-ed in the Outlook section of the Washington Post, not to be missed. Um, so, but, but the argument I made uh, in it uh, came as a result of uh, kind of uh, a, as a synthesis that, that came to me after years and years of trying to figure a certain thing out, which um, I kind of talked over with Alan and everyone else at the table. And I don't, I, from Alan's reaction, I'm not sure if he went for it, but, but I'll try it on the rest of you. Um, I, I, uh, and and it, it's also part of what I um, talk about when I talk about Argo in, in my review of the movie uh, for the Daily Beast. Um, I think um, whether by design or by accident um, that these um, rulers in the Middle East, um, or, or let's be more focused in Iran, have figured out exactly what sort of drama uh, captures our attentions and imaginations here uh, in the United States and in the West. And they, they, they precisely have figured out how to press our buttons. And they do it very successfully. 
And, and part of the reason why they're better at it than we are, they, they have figured us out, uh, in, in my view, much better than we have figured them out. Because uh, if you listen to policymakers and, and politicians here in this country, they always say, Iran is such a complex country. Uh, it's so difficult to figure out how to, what to do about Iran. But Iranians don't say that about us. They're always clear-headed. They know exactly who we are and how to deal with us. So that, that I mean, there's something to, to mull over here, why, why their view is so clear. And in part, I think it's because they, they have spent the last 33 years uh, trying to stay in power. They haven't worried about the ozone layer. They haven't been trying to figure out how to save you know, social security or anything. You know, they haven't been uh, planning for a future, uh, but they have been planning um, and focusing entirely on the issue of how do we survive? How do we continue to stay in power? How do we defeat our enemies and, and um, continue to be where we are? And I think, um, now I know you're thinking she's, she's, uh, she's gone far away from Malala, but, but um, he, he, I think the drama here is very important to pay attention to. In the case of the American hostage crisis, um, my beef with the movie, which I found extremely entertaining, was that it focuses on, on the hostage crisis, even though it tries to be sympathetic to, to the plight of Iranians and in, in creating sympathy, it says, well, Iranians were angry with us because we had this 1953 coup and, and therefore they, they were right to take over the American embassy because we had supported the Shah, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but what really happened, which the movie fails to point out, is that the hostage crisis drama, the takeover of the embassy, created the smoke sc screen for all of us here, behind which the democratic or the moderate elements who were in power, who were the people I wrote about when, or I wanted to write about when I wanted to write my memoir, um, uh, 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 failed. In other words, it, the most important thing that's missing from, from this film is the fact that the interim government of Iran, the provisional government, which was composed of a group of Harvard, UC Berkeley, uh, Yale-educated people who had gone back to Iran to build a democracy, resigned because they protested the act of the takeover. It had nothing to do with 1953. This is what they did then. How can you retell the story of the hostage crisis without saying that within the Iranian of con within the country of Iran, even within the government, the entire government protested the takeover of the American embassy by resigning because they wanted, they thought this was the most egregious act possible. They, they didn't want the students inside the embassy. They didn't want hostages at all. They didn't want to ruin their relations with the United States whatsoever. And, and so that was missing. Now, why did Iran need this? Iran needed this because Iran needed to, to force them out of power because Ayatollah Khomeini and the radical elements, the hardline elements within the Iranian revolution at the time were looking for a dramatic moment to weaken their own opposition. And the hostage crisis provided them with this fantastic opportunity. And you know what? All of our attentions were focused on the 52 hostages. And, and while we were busy watching this, they went around and, and brought back everything that they, the, the hardliners led by Ayatollah Khomeini had always intended to do, including um, reinstituting the veil for women, mandatory veil, whereas prior to the revolution, uh, it was veil by choice. Those who wanted to put it on did, and those who didn't, didn't put it on. Um, so all the bad things that, that you fear a theocracy would uh, institute uh, was instituted while we were all focused uh, purely and solely on the hostages and, and of course a whole government uh, also in protest resigned and so the ones who came uh, to power afterwards were a completely uh, a far more extreme cast of characters. And, and so I think, the, now, how does this relate to Malala? In that I think this entire anti-Americanism uh, or acts of uh, religious extremism in the region 
is derailing us from paying attention to what they do when they put this theater up. You know, um, and, and you know, what, what happens when they come out to the streets and shout, you know, death to America, death to America. Uh, they go home and they take away the right of their women uh, immediately to, to educate themselves, to attend universities. In, in Iran in the past uh, year, uh, lots and lots of uh, fields and universities that had been initially banned from, for women in the beginning of the revolution uh, were banned once again. Because we're really busy looking at nuclear issue. You know, because every headline, every day dedicated to Iran is about nukes. What do we do about the nukes? And, and so while all of this drama, well, all of this theater, um, you know, and, and chief among them is always these uh, hostile, severe uh, acts of anti-Americanism occur, um, you always have to ask yourself, what are they doing domestically? That they need to focus our attentions on this. And I, and I think ultimately what I want to say about Malala and what, what I did say in the piece is that it's, you know, it's really a case of uh, rather than looking at it from a, a situation with religious extremism or a situation where we need to understand how Islam operates. Is, is there something we need to understand more about Islam to address this crisis better? My answer is it's not about any of this. Because when you look at it uh, from inside, when, when they say we want Islamic democracy as, as opposed to simple democracy, what it really means is that you know, the, the Islamic that they attach to the notion of democracy is that we really want to, to take certain rights away from women. We really don't want to make them equal citizens. We really are, want to carry on with this gender apartheid. And, and that's what we mean when we say uh, Islamic democracy. Because at the end of the day, uh, it's not about God. It's not about how we want to pray in, you know, what, what prayers we want to say. It's about uh, in, in, in the most practical step-by-step uh, uh, -step way that it will affect our conduct. It boils down to how will women and vulnerable minorities will be treated. And that's, that's what that does. So I think, I think this basically is a struggle um, on behalf of, uh, it's, it's about the, the last frontier of feminism. And, and we have to acknowledge it as such. We can, we can learn all we want in the world about you know, the state of Islam and how Shiism and Sunnism are, are different from each other. But when, when we look at it in, in a very, very pragmatic sense, it's, it's, it translates into a, a life for women that is ruled by men who want to stay in power and who want to maintain power over them. And I see Malala in that context. I see, uh, I see the failure of the democratic movements in the region in that context because they don't want to be egalitarian. They don't want to provide equal rights to their women. I'll be shorter in my responses in the next <laughs> questions. OK, we'll turn to Jonathan Ferrante from Smithtown High School in New York State. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm only about 30, 40% through the book. No, you can't ask a question. Oh, OK. Only people who have finished. <laughs> um, I, I, what I'm really curious about is, is the people that you're writing about really seem to be very much on the edge economically uh, within Germany. These are not rich people from what I'm gathering. Uh, this is pre-internet, uh, it's pre-cell phone. Uh, why did the regime feel that they really needed to go after these people? Why not, okay, they're out of the country, fine. Um, I, I mean, were people back in Iran even aware that these assassinations were happening? Or was the message for other people of the diaspora saying, hey, we've got your number and we're coming for you? Yes. Um, um, well, uh, first of all, welcome to refugee life. Um, this is what refugees live like. You know, you, you, you have been, ha, ha, uh, have had perfect, perfectly successful profession in your country of origin. You are forced out of your country. You land in Europe or United States. You drive a taxi. 
you know, and, uh, and that's what refugees live like. So their economic status can be um, explained by that. Now, um, the regime did this. Um, well, first of all, because the regime didn't want these people around, but it was also a, a wonderful way um, to do several other things. One was to create a, a very insecure environment for Iranians abroad, so um, which um, enhance the, their own sense of ubiquity and, and the sense of ubiquity that they conveyed and wanted to convey to their own opposition, that no matter where you go, you know, you are never safe. You could be, you could be in the suburbs of Washington, uh, as the first victim was, and we will come and get you. And you know what? No one in the world cares about you because we will um, we will either, we will somehow deal with them. And in this particular case, what's, what's absolutely fascinating, and, and um, one of the speakers uh, talking about the freeing of the hostages in, uh, you know, various Western hostages in, in Lebanon and elsewhere talking, referred to, 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 to the existence of these hostages. Um, well, in, after this assassination, Iran sends an envoy to, to Germany, um, and in a secret meeting, um, the Iranian envoy tells uh, to one of the highest officials in Germany that we will free any hostage you name. All we want for you to do is not allow this trial to begin. And so what's interesting, uh, it's not that he's making this demand, but it's also fab fascinating to see that that Iranian official cannot fathom the notion of an independent justice system that cannot be influenced by a politician. And so when the politician tells him, but we can't do it, we can try to help you to control the, the fallout of it, from it, but we can't prevent the court from starting. And, and that's really significant. The, the, the thing that is um, really uh, important to remember is that it, Iran used to take hostage also because it wanted to be able to negotiate with the Western world in cases like this. So then it, it, it created a dilemma for, for the Western policymakers that if Iran freed them, then would they really reward them? So it, because if they rewarded them, would they not learn to go then, or, you know, capture some more hostages? I mean, it, it, this is what, uh, what made dealing with this or looking at this freeing of the hostages as a, as a, you know, something that Iran ought to have been rewarded for because uh, Iran was particularly doing this in order to place itself in a position of, of negotiating power. And um, part of the reason why the West didn't want to reward Iran when Iran freed hostages was because it didn't want to encourage bad behavior. Yes? Yeah, so this clarify that wasn't Nouri just in the wrong place at the wrong time? Wasn't the, the doctor the one they were really trying to kill? I mean. That's, that was the target, right? The other guys are just kind of in the wrong place at the wrong time. And well, um, so th the names that, uh, that came up in this question are the names of the, f the, the two of the victims. And, um, uh, you know, I, I asked that question from, from the chief investigative officer, and he believed that um, because Nuri had, this is, this is uh, the translator, who was at the restaurant, the, the sort of the fourth guy who shouldn't have been killed because he wasn't, um, he wasn't a very consequential uh, person. Um, but, but the investigator told me that, you know, they wouldn't have wasted seven bullets on him if they really didn't want him um, to die. But, but surely the ones that they didn't tend to kill were the ones that they put a coup de grace in. So, um, the, the chief assassin with the machine gun had a backup who went up to um, two individuals and that they had come to kill and put a final bullet in their heads. Yes? I was wondering, um, you said that you were a teenager during the 
you said you were a teenager during the revolution and you said you were Jewish. Yes. Okay. I was wondering, did your life change dramatically or in any way, and if so, how uh, during that time period? Uh, yes, but are you asking if my life changed as a result because I was Jewish? Yes. Or because there was a revolution? Because there was a revolution and maybe because you were Jewish. Right. Well, you should read my first book. <laughs> <laughs> but, but. Uh, no, you, you don't. there are so many good books, but you know, if you're particularly interested in that answer. Um, it, you know, I, it, it's very hard to try to explain uh, this uh, to, to uh, audiences, but I'll try each time, and uh, I haven't succeeded. But, but here's, here's the, the very strange dynamics about this thing. Um, it was, if, you were a Jew in Iran after 1979. If you were a Jew in Iran today, and there is still a community of, um, of 20, 25,000 Jews left in Iran, <clears throat> which makes Iran uh, perhaps um, the second largest community of Jews in the Middle East after Israel, uh, or neck and neck with Turkey, although it, it still could be larger in Iran. Uh, the community in Iran can be larger uh, but the fact is that there are Jews who are living um, without identifying themselves as Jewish. Um, and therefore, you know, it's very hard to, to capture the number. But um, even if it were to be after Turkey, uh, it's still a significant community. Um, but you are a second class human being in Iran if you are a Jewish person. And that's because of the way the Constitution is written. Um, and it's not written to particularly turn Jews into second class citizens. But, it's, but the Constitution is designed to turn vulnerable minorities, women, Sunnis, um, the Baha'is don't even begin, we can't even begin to touch that because the Baha'is uh, are actively persecuted in Iran today. And if a, a member of the Baha'i minority admits to being a Baha'i, you know, they, they can't register in school, they can't educate themselves. Baha the Baha'i have underground universities and provide their children with underground education um, if, if the kids admit openly that they're Baha'i. But um, so, so it, it, the complexity in, in responding to this comes from the fact that uh, yes, it's, it, yes, you are damned if you're a Jew in Iran today, um, but, but that hasn't come as a result of certain specific anti-Semitic uh, laws or uh, behaviors that, that the regime is systematically pursuing. It comes as a result of an ideological messianic regime uh, that wants people to either be with it or if they're not with it, they will be enemies uh, against it, which they will pursue. And I think this is a, a very important uh, distinction to make, that, that yes, it's, uh, it's bad for Jews in Iran, but then it's bad for um, vulnerable minorities and people who don't see eye to eye with the regime. I'm afraid it's uh, 8 o'clock, which is 12 hours after we began this day and 12 hours before we begin tomorrow. But let me ask one final question before you uh, hang up here. And that is, you mentioned that the liberal democratic forces that seem to be at the forefront of the revolution were pushed out very early on. And that same phenomenon seems to have happened in Egypt and elsewhere in the Middle East for the logical reason that the religious forces are organized and the liberal democratic forces are disorganized. So how do you, uh, as we started to discuss at dinner, how do you see the next phase? How does that come about? How do you move from where we are today to something better? Well, um, I do discuss that in a different article, by the way, but <laughs> um, it, it's, it's the million dollar question, I think. Uh, part of what's uh, truly missing uh, uh, at, at our end, I, I, I think 
things in, in Iran and in the rest of the region can change for the better and, and the democratic forces that we want to see empowered can be empowered. But part of that has to do with us becoming wiser and smarter about in our own approach. So um, I, for instance, I think uh, you know, each time we, we have an inconsistent policy towards Iran or the policy drastic change, drastically changes from one administration to the next. Uh, the bad forces in Iran are empowered, are strengthened, and the good forces are, are thus weakened. Uh, I think the, the, the uh, misguided policies within Iraq uh, strengthen the regime in Tehran. I think you know, the, uh, the first two years of uh, the Obama administration from a purely Iran um, policy standpoint were disastrous for the good forces inside Iran because the, the administration was trying to figure out what to do and, you know, uh, and, you know the, um, as Sorab Ahmari put, um, points out in a wonderful article, um, the fact that President Obama didn't support the 2009 democratic movement um, I don't think uh, this, the American support for the 2009 democratic movement would, would, have, would have been definitive, but I think it would have been morally really important uh, for the movement inside Iran. And I think, so I think what we can do here in the United States is to come up with a consistent policy that, um, that delivers the same message. Um, I think the sanctions have finally been smart, been made smart. Uh, they are creating pressure on Iran, which is why we see them uh, sort of uh, being willing to, to come to the negotiating table. So I think that the thing that we can do at this end is to make sure that um, we say, uh, we speak with clarity and, and bipartisanship uh, does not uh, infiltrate our, our Iran policy. And I think within Iran, um, I also think that Syria is a huge, huge, has a huge impact on Iran and the fact that, you know, it, it, you have had 30,000 people die uh, in a country where Iranian intelligence are on the ground. Members of the high-ranking members of the Revolutionary Guards have actually been, cap uh, been arrested by the Syrian rebels and this has gone on has a huge demoralizing impact on the forces in, within Iran. So I think there is a lot that the international community can do in both dealing with Iran and dealing with the areas surrounding Iran in which Iran exerts uh, influence and kind of facing Iran in, in Syria and weakening it through um, you know, bring, get, bringing about a peace in Syria faster. And the rest is for Iranians within the country to figure out, which I think will be much easier to figure out once these two things fall into place. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> that was great. Thank you.